What's up, everybody? Welcome into another edition of the Sit Down, a Crime and Mafia History Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Nadu, joined as always by our consigliere, our legal expert, our partner in crime, our co-host, Blackjack Fletcher. Blackjack, what's happening? How are you? Uh, always good to uh, talk to you. Another week, another sit down. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great, brother. It's, uh, looking forward to getting into today's topic. I think this is one that uh, yeah. a lot of people will have some familiarity with, but uh, we'll be interested to learn some of the details of. Yeah. And, you know, Blackjack kind of alluded to it. Um, we're going to get right to the show because we got a great one today. We're going to talk about Jimmy Burke. Um, and I think one thing needs to be said right out of the gate about Jimmy Burke, you can make the case. And I don't even know if there's a case to make on anyone else. Um, Jimmy Burke is the most successful non-Italian uh, mobster of all time. Uh, it's that simple. Um, yep. Not only did he amass a ton of wealth, but he amassed a ton of power. He amassed a ton of respect. Uh, he was a crew. He was a cold, calculated individual who, um, you know, killed. Uh, and again, we relate this to the go- uh, movie Goodfellas. Uh, obviously, if you know anything about the movie, you know Jimmy Conway. Um, Jimmy Conway is based on Jimmy Burke. Uh, all those people are real. Uh, everyone from Paul Cicero, who was mm-hmm. Paul Vario. Uh, Henry Hill, who had the same name, um, they were all involved. Uh, Tommy uh, De Simone, all those guys were involved. And we're really going to talk about them all today, with really concentration into Jimmy Burke. Uh, you know, it's really crazy how powerful Jimmy Burke was. Some of the schemes he was able to pull off in his his career, not only the Lufthansa heist, but the point shaving scandal at Boston College. Uh, we'll get into the Billy Bat situation, which was a real event that did actually happen. Um, and we'll kind of get into some of the myths of the movie and what was true and what wasn't. And, you know, Black Chick, in fact, if you watch the movie and you know anything about Burke, a lot of Burke's teenage years uh, were very reminiscent of how they portrayed Henry Hill. Um, not a lot's known about Henry Hill, uh, really, up until he met Jimmy Burke. Um, but we'll kind of get into all that, the main players, the people involved, um, you know, the, the big heist that went down and, and some other really interesting you know, it's funny, Blackjack, um, a quote by Jimmy Burke right at the start. Uh, he was asked about his life and, and, you know, regrets that he had and what he would have did wrong. And I guess the person that asked him this didn't expect him to respond. But he was quoted as saying one time that uh, as uh, this, he said, my downfall was I was too greedy, too much money, too much heat. Um, and, you know, you can be as secret and as you know, paranoid as you want. But at the end of the day, the ultimate equalizer, Blackjack, is money. And um, Jimmy Burke, uh, there were just too many folks involved. And really a fascinating guy. You'd agree. I mean, a lot of famous and powerful Italian guys. But um, you, know, you can't ever be made if you're not Italian. And, you know, Jimmy Burke was uh, quite fo- quite powerful, which we'll get into. Yeah, I mean, I think you can say, and, and you kind of, of, of uh, you know, touched on it, that he was, I mean, he was a made man without the title, right? I mean, he had every bit of power, influence, sway, control, success. I mean, he was everything that a made man was without having that title, which is not an easy thing to get. I mean, part of part of the deal with the mafia is it is an, an insular organization, right? I mean, you that's that's you know the main gateway to entry. And so for him to be kind of embrace the way he was is incredibly rare and is a testament to to him yeah and like i said you know we'll get into the biography we'll get into the different players we'll get into the stories that obviously relate to goodfellas but i think it's important to dispose of certain myths about the movie um look every movie can't be exactly true um but look for anyone, people have asked my opinion on the movie. Um, I think it's very good. Uh, it's one of the best mob movies ever. Mm-hmm. Um, do I like the fact that they kind of glom on to Henry Hill like he was some, you know, you know, boss, basically? No. I mean, if you know Henry Hill, he was an associate. That was all he was. Uh, he was a lackey, basically. Uh, he was, you know, a guy that, you know, created schemes. He definitely w- was a, a tough guy and did things, but... Um, you know, the movie that should be made is about Jimmy Burke. Jimmy Burke was really the, the architect of all this stuff. Uh, let's get into it. Jimmy Burke, 
on the sit down. Uh, as always, we are powered by Stable Duel. Make sure you go checking out Stable Duel. Uh, tourist racing season, folks. We got uh, the, the Kentucky Derby just happened. Uh, the Preakness at Pimlico just happened. Uh, we've got the Belmont Stakes here uh, in a few weeks. Uh, and then it's summer uh, horse racing, you know, all the great tracks. Make sure you're going and checking out Stable Duel, uh, one of the big and up and coming apps. You're probably seeing it everywhere if you're moving around in the sports betting community or the sports community. Stable Duel is the next big thing. Um, you know, they have fantasy for football and basketball and baseball. Why not a horse racing app uh, for fantasy? Um, and I would go check it out. It's a great way to make some some coin. You don't have to go and you necessarily deposit money on a, on a horse racing account to make money. Go check out Stable Duel. Uh, all right, Blackjack, let it jump into it. Uh, Jimmy Burke, James Burke, was born Blackjack James Conway. Uh, that's where they got the name from. That's what they called him in the movie. He was actually born James Conway uh, in the Bronx, New York, on July 5th, 1931. Basically, just after the Depression, early 30s, uh, the country was kind of... Uh, trying to create itself again. There were still droves of immigrants coming into this country from Europe. Um, Jimmy was born to his mother, Jane Conway. Uh, Jane Conway was a rough woman. She was from Ireland. She was a prostitute. Uh, she was destitute. She didn't have much. Um, he doesn't know his father. His father, James, uh, they didn't identify until later in his life. Uh, and he wasn't a part of his life. Uh, neither was his mom. At age two, uh, she basically left Jimmy on the uh, porch of a foster home uh, and uh, basically abandoned him. Uh, Jimmy Burke had, I think, more of one of the sadder childhoods in, in mob history as far as, you know, a lot of these guys have a father or uh, even a good family. Uh, some are connected to the mob, some aren't. Right. Um, but it's rare where you don't see both parents involved. I know John Gotti, he didn't have a great uh, father figure. Uh, he did have a mom, though, and she was very important, but... It's rare blackjack to see, you know, most people, most people have at least one parent. Um, Jimmy Burke's the only mob guy that I'm familiar with that didn't have both parents growing up. Pretty sad. Yeah, it's really sad. And, you know, I, I think there's a certain amount of logic behind it, right? Like, yeah. I think if you grow up without either parent in your life, I mean, your father, you never knew who he was. Your mother literally abandoned you on a doorstep. I mean, that's, it's some of the most God awful shit you can imagine. I think that, you know, I don't know that you're drawn to the concept of family at that point. You kind of, I think you, you're almost a lone wolf in the world, you know? So it's, yeah, I think it, 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 it goes to show you that yes, a lot of the people who get involved in the mafia do generally come from larger, strong families. Yeah. And, you know, really for the next 10 years, basically from two years old up until his early teens, um, Jimmy Burke had a rough life. Um, he was, abused mentally, physically, sexually, emotionally. Um, he was basically at a, a Roman Catholic uh, orphanage and you know, he had a, a lot of trauma, a lot, thing, a lot of things going on that a little kid shouldn't have to deal with and see and, and be a part of. And, um, you know, he just never really had anyone that cared about him. And as you said, you know, it's tough to grow up in a, a situation like that and expect to come out not fucked up, basically. Um, when he was 13, he was actually adopted by uh, two people. Um, and basically one day, um, you know, they weren't great people. Uh, one day, uh, Jimmy's riding around with his foster father, uh, and he does something to, you know, I'm sure you, when you're a kid, remember this. I remember one or two times where I did something and my dad would grab me and you know, give me a crack or something. Um, so this guy, I guess Jimmy does something in the back of the car. The foster father tries to discipline him. And as he's doing it, he loses control of the car, um, and basically is killed. Um, Jimmy's unharmed in the back seat, but the father dies. Uh, his wife, who was Jimmy's foster mother, uh, basically blamed Jimmy for the accident and basically severely beat him, uh, sexually abused him, um, really just just took it out on him. Uh, and he was then subsequently sent right back to foster care. Uh, it wasn't until his early teens, uh, basically a year or two after that, he finally gets adopted by the Burks, uh, a normal family. Uh, and he ultimately takes their name. They were so integral to his life. And this is where Jimmy really starts to, to, to find that family dynamic, that nuclear family. Um, they were the only family he knew. Um, and good on the Burks for, for basically rescuing him from probably, um, you know, the last couple of years before he got really old, where you know, he, he may have done something uh, even up before the, 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 the connection of the mob. Uh, they lived down on Far Rockaway. 
uh, in Queens. And he spent a lot of that time in calm. Uh, it was nice because they, you know, they celebrated his birthday and they had Christmases and, um, you know, up until, you know, really he went to prison, he would, uh, send them money. Uh, he would attempt, uh, to, to still take care of them after the fact he really, uh, took to them and, and they were the only family he knew blackjack. It was nice that, uh, it's always, I think one of the nicest things you'll see is when a child gets parents. Um, you know, there are a lot of really genuine moments on earth. That's one of the good ones. Every kid deserves a family. Yeah. I mean, I just, just, and, and especially, you know, these people, I mean, you talk about the, the night and day comparison. I mean, his foster father dies trying to hit him. And yeah. then his foster mother not only beats him, but sexually abuses him. I mean, you don't often hear of women sexually abusing boys. That, that's not the, the yeah. common theme there. These people were fucking monsters. Okay. And then think about it. You don't hear of a lot of families looking to adopt, you know, 14, 15 year old kids who have been abused. Like that's not what people generally look to take in. So the Burke family, I mean, you go from a couple of monsters to a couple of fucking saints. Yeah, no, you're so true. No, right. And, you know, by that time though, sadly, Jimmy was kind of damaged already. Uh, he was going to become a, cr a criminal. And, you know, it was basically said that around 16, he decided this is what I want to do. Uh, I'm going to go into a life of crime and, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go the way of, of the streets. And, um, at basically 16, like many other mobsters, he meets an older guy in the neighborhood uh, in Queens um, called Remo Sirisani. Um, and basically they start uh, doing capers together. They start coming up with schemes. Sirisani was uh, kind of a, a, not a low level associate, but he was a, uh, at the time, an associate in the Colombo crime family, he would eventually become a capo in the Colombo crime family. He was basically enacted as the mentor to Jimmy Burke. Um, and they had some schemes where they were uh, passing bad checks, uh, this check scheme. Uh, eventually, uh, in 1949, at 18, Jimmy um, gets arrested, right? They pull him in. Uh, they try to get him to squeal on his contemporaries. He says no. He doesn't say a word. And this is an ode to the scene in Goodfellas when Henry Hill is arrested for selling cigarettes and he doesn't rat. Remember, Jimmy says to him, never rat on your friends and always keep your mouth shut. Um, this is basically the, the story behind that. Jimmy doesn't squeal uh, and basically, you know, gets Dom Sirisani out of it. Uh, and Jimmy ends up going to jail. He heads up to Auburn State Prison up in uh, northern New York uh, and, and does his time. During his time in Auburn, he meets uh, certain mobsters. He starts becoming connected. Um, and, you know, I think the interesting thing about Jimmy by this point is he's a big guy. Um, he had a good camaraderie with, with the Italians, and he had connections. He was already involved with, with Remo Sirisani, uh, and he had, you know, willingness to, to do things. And uh, they like that. By this point, Jimmy's big, as I said. I was 6'3", 230, real yeah. buff, big, burly guy. And uh, he was an immense guy. A lot of people were terrified of him. Um, so he gets out of prison. He comes home, and his foster father has a connection to the unions. They get him uh, a job as a union bricklayer, and that's where he continues to really chisel his body uh, your big arms, you know, weirdly enough, Blackjack, when I was a kid, um, I've told you before, uh, my father's in the construction business. And when I was a kid, my dad was a concrete contractor and I men spent many summers, um, you know, pouring cement and, uh, you know, carrying bricks and, and, and all sorts of stuff. So you, know, you can become a summer or two, you can get jacked, uh, if you're out there. And Jimmy Burke, uh, by this point was, you know, almost, pushing 250 pounds and most of it was muscle. Um, and that's where his real connections start to happen. Uh, he meets Paul Vario. And if you've seen Goodfellas, he would be the Paul Cicero character. Mm -hmm. uh, Paulie was a uh, really a do-it-all mobster. Uh, he was a capo in the Bonanno, uh, or sorry, the Lucchese crime family and had a lot of connections to the union. He kind of got to like uh, Jimmy, kind of understood that he made money and he was willing to, to hurt people. He was like kind of an enforcer, if you will. Um, he kind of stakes Jimmy. Jimmy goes and starts uh, a loan sharking and bookmaking business. 
uh, right out of Ozone Park, Queens. If you know anything about Paul Vario, he ran out of Ozone Park. Now, remember, uh, John Gotti ran out of Ozone Park as well. Uh, Bergen Hunt and Flish Club was in Ozone Park. Um, you know, there are different neighborhoods, different, you know, groups and families uh, kind of moved around in both of them. Uh, the good thing about uh, Ozone Park is it's not too far from Kennedy Airport, uh, and it was a great breeding ground for criminals. Um, right. Aqueduct Racetrack also in Ozone Yes, Park. exactly. Uh, you know, Paul really got to like Jimmy as well because, as I said, he was gigantic. Uh, people didn't want to fuck with Jimmy Burke. <laughs> um, it's pretty simple. Uh, you know, you don't want to mess with anyone that's big um, at the end of the day. But, you know, Henry Hill and his uh, drunken stupors most of the time said a lot of dumb shit. But uh, he had some pretty good quotes about Jimmy Burke. Um, he, he, he said this one time about Jimmy. Jimmy was a big man and he knew how to handle himself. He looked like a fighter and a warrior. You could see it in his eyes. He was fearless when it came to fighting or killing people. And he was terrifying. He had an evil ice cold stare that could petrify any man, no matter where or where, who they were. If there were just the li littlest amount of trouble, he'd be all over you in a second. He'd grab a guy's tie and slam his chin into the table before the, he knew, before the guy knew he was in a war and he'd go to war with anybody. Basically, he was sadistic. Um, so, you know, he was a cold and calculated guy. And not only was he powerful and rich, you know, but in the mob blackjack, there are two folks generally. There are killers uh, and enforcers and there are money people. Um, and if you're a money guy, you're not generally going to kill people. Uh, Jimmy Burke was both of them. And that's what the mob loved about him. Uh, and they didn't care that he was uh, Irish. Um, he made money at the end of the day. And that's what mattered. Um, and Paul loved him because Jimmy was making tons of money from his bookmaking and loan sharking business. And he was kicking it up to Paul and the Lucchese family. Uh, in 1962, basically at 31 years old, uh, Jimmy meets a women, woman called Mickey Marin. Um, he grows to uh, really like her. Uh, they go out on some dates. And during this time, this is another um, inspiration to Goodfellas. If you remember, Henry Hill meets Karen. They go out on dates. Um, and if you remember in the movie, she has that neighbor, Bruce, that's like bothering her. Yep. And Henry goes and like beats him basically with, with the gun. Yes. That actually really happened. Um, uh, Jimmy's wife, Mickey, who he ended up marrying, uh, there was a neighbor uh, that was an ex-boyfriend of hers um, and he was giving Mickey issues and you know, Jimmy basically attacked him at one point. Uh, they end up getting married and right after they get married, Jimmy decides that you know, he's had enough of this guy uh, and he's going to go uh, take care of him. So Jimmy goes, finds this guy and basically begins with a chainsaw to cut parts of him up. And if you know, when you cut a chainsaw, pieces fall off, right? Yeah, um, so basically you're nicking somebody to death and Jimmy Burke killed this guy with a chainsaw. The problem was, um, and this was the first real connection to murder Jimmy had. There was no proof of it though. Um, there was no evidence and you know, Jimmy ever, never ended up being convicted, but this was one of the first murders that we know of that Jimmy committed. And remember, uh, this was just a, a woman, um, you know, that he ended up marrying that somebody was, was messing with, um, so he takes care of them. Uh, Jimmy um, and Mickey have uh, two daughters um, and two sons. Uh, weirdly enough, Jimmy Burke was obsessed with Jesse and Frank James, weirdly enough, uh, the old uh, outlaw brothers. Uh, and he named his sons Frank and Jesse, um, which kind of odd, Blackjack. Um, but that yeah, was, uh, that was it's, him. It's a little bit of an odd uh, association for – a guy that's, you know, basically affiliated with the mafia, but, you know, I just think it kind of speaks to, to his thought process, right? I mean, Jesse James was, you know, the, the great, you know, train robbing bandit across the United States. And he was, he's one of the most famous outlaws in American history. I mean, Jesse James and Billy the Kid are the, the stereotypical American outlaws. And I think that may be a little bit of insight into how, how, you know, Jimmy Burke viewed himself. Yeah, he definitely, definitely liked the outlaw. He liked the bad guy. And if you remember in the movie, uh, Henry Hill is quoted as saying uh, Jimmy was the kind of guy that rooted for the bad guys in the movies. Um, that was an ode to the Jesse and Frank James uh, connection. Um, in the early 60s, Jimmy, um, you know, again, was doing a big, had a big loan sharking business. 
with the connection to uh, Idlewild Airport at the time, which is now JFK, um, they were running out of a bar in Ozone Park. And you know, Jimmy was really growing his business because he would have airport employees and people that would come in that you know needed loans, they needed to make bets. Uh, it was a perfect spot. And you know, being that close, uh, he started getting people that would become in debt to him. Uh, and what that turned to is this is where Jimmy's hijacking crew, hijacking a career starts. Uh, he basically starts getting people that owe him money. Um, you know, they aren't able to pay and they say, well, look, uh, I got a, I got an in at, at Idlewild and we can get you hijacking stuff. So they start hijacking, you know, anything that you could sell, whether it was clothes, whether it was shrimp, lobster, cigarettes, uh, electronics, whatever, uh, whatever they could find, they were selling and stealing and fencing. Uh, so by this point, this is when Jimmy meets Henry Hill and Tommy D. Simone. Now, the story about Tommy and Henry from the movies where they're selling cigarettes, that is true. Uh, but Jimmy didn't actually meet Henry until he was uh, basically Henry was in his 20s. Uh, he was already uh, involved. The, the story that Henry grew up around the mob is largely untrue as far as I know. Uh, he didn't know Paul Vario when he was a kid. He didn't know Jimmy Burke when he was a kid. He didn't know Tommy until his late teenage years when he began selling cigarettes and moving around with mob guys. Um, that's where Tommy and, and, and Henry meet. And they indeed then meet Jimmy Burke, who's basically creating a crew under Paul Varios. There was a lot of um, basically connections and there was a big tree involved with Paul Vario. Now, just a quick background on Tommy uh, Blackjack. Tommy DeSimone, uh, played by Joe Pesci in the movie. Um, his father was very connected. His family was very connected. In fact, uh, some of his uncles were big time uh, mobsters out in LA. Uh, they were in the LA crime family. Um, and weirdly enough, uh, the shoe shining stories about Tommy DeSimone were true. Um, it was said one time when Tommy was young, he would never leave his house without his shoes shined. And he would basically was a, a legend in the mob community. He was basically shining shoes and he shined them so nice you could shave off them, according to people. Um, and that's where the I don't shine shoes no more, Billy, came from. Um, and it was discussed that in his previous life, uh, when he was a kid, he did shine Billy Bat shoes at one point. Um Tommy always had a chip on his shoulder, Blackjack, because uh, his brother, uh, Anthony, was an informant. And it was a real death nail to the family. Tommy really took it in jest. Um, he was disgusted by it. And he had a, an ax to grind. He wanted to basically, you know, right the wrong and say, look, you know, I'm a real, ga real guy, real gangster, real mobster. I'm true Cosa Nostra. And um, he always had that chip on his shoulder because of it. Yeah, I mean, I think that Tommy D. Simone's a really interesting guy. And one day I'm sure we'll do one of these on him. But, you know, the one thing, too, that I think is interesting is that, you know, you watch the movie Goodfellas and we see Joe Pesci play him and you think like, OK, because Joe Pesci is probably I don't know, early 40s when that movie is made. Yeah. Tommy D. Simone, when he was killed, was like 28 years old. Yeah. So, I mean, he did a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. And his family is pretty interesting, too, because like you said, you know, he's got the one brother who who, you know, turned and that was a problem. And then his sister, to kind of tie it all back, one of his sisters was Jimmy Burke's mistress. Yeah, there was a lot of weird connections from a sexual standpoint with which we'll get to um, in a little bit with not only him, but Paul Vario uh, with uh, with all sorts of people. It, it was definitely some weird things going on with certain folks. Uh, in that cohort um, in uh, 19. So, so basically these two young guys start running around with Jimmy uh, and they form a crew in 1967. Um, this is where the big hijacking really starts. Uh, mm -hmm. Jimmy basically realizes that the air France terminal had um, become the carrier of American currency. Um, so they would bring it from you know, Asia and Europe and the airline would basically um, you move the money into U.S. banks. And Jimmy finds out about this through uh, a guy called uh, Robert McMahon, who in the movie is called Frenchie, if you remember. Yep. Um, uh, he's in a couple of movies that actor. I don't know who it is exactly. But uh, so basically he tips off Robert McMahon, Jimmy Burke, that uh, there was a big time delivery of money coming in, basically an amount of like four hundred to seven hundred thousand uh, dollars. So basically five hundred thousand uh, in U.S. currency. Now, remember, this is in 1967. 
uh, that would be basically an equivalent to like four to five million dollars. Yep. So this is a ton of money. Um, and it's not like some of the other heists, you know, where it's like you steal cigarettes or goods. This is straight cash. You, yeah. you, you and, walk out the building, it's yours. Yeah. So on Friday, April 7th, they get this idea, 1967, that this is going to happen. Um, Frenchie McMahon basically said that the best time for the actual robbery would be uh, right around midnight. There was a security guard. He was an older guy. Um, and they got to know this guy. And from what the different stories that have come out, I guess this guy would go on a meal break and he was a bit of a, an old horn dog, if you will. Um, so they basically set up a prostitute to basically lure him into a, a room of some sort <laughs> and steal his keys, basically. Um, so they go um, to, to, to do this. Uh, and they basically walk in and just basically grab the bag and, and, and that's that no one was injured, no alarm, no shots. Uh, and it was great because the discovery didn't happen until Monday, uh, the following Monday. Um, so they basically make off with a huge, huge score. Uh, and Jimmy, um, you know, obviously doles it out to the contemporaries uh, Paul Vario gets his cut. The Lucchese crime family gets their cut. Uh, the Bonanno crime family gets their cut. I believe they were partners as well at uh, Idlewild. Um, and everybody's making money. Uh, at that time, uh, Jimmy buys Robert's Lounge, which is uh, a basically a quasi-social club bar. It was in Ozone Park. It was really close to Kennedy Airport. Uh, and, you know, Jimmy's kind of creating a, a real money-making opportunity. And it would just kind of start there. Um, Jimmy also... Blackjack, one of the big rackets for mob families, especially in New York, in the hijacking business was cigarettes. Yep. Uh, cigarettes were, you know, a big moneymaker because at this time in New York, um, the tax on cigarettes was one of the highest in the country. Uh, New York had this crusade against cigarettes and they wanted to kind of limit them. So they made it hard to get them. Uh, Jimmy finds out that uh, in, you know, southern states like North Carolina, you could go down there and buy a ton of cigarettes and basically take them back to New York and sell them for crazy profit margins. Um, so they go down, uh, uh, Rima Sirisani is involved, his old mentor, uh, and they start basically um, grabbing these cigarettes and, and taking them back to New York and, and flipping them. One time uh, a truck's coming back, Remo Sirisani gets arrested uh, during this uh, scheme and if we remember back to Jimmy's childhood, he didn't cooperate against Remo. He saved Remo back in the day. Mm -hmm. The problem was Remo was not as strong an individual. Uh, and Reno Sarasani flips on Jimmy Burke. Um, Jimmy finds out about it. They spot Remo at Robert's Lounge. Uh, Tommy DeSimone uh, then lures him into a car and they go for a ride. And Tommy strangles him with a piano wire. So that was that for Remo and Remo had to go. He was a rat. Uh, he had basically, um, you know, I'm not saying that uh, you should kill a guy, but you know, Remo deserved to die. Blackjack. He, uh, he basically fucked Jimmy Burke. I mean, dude. And if you think about it, like this isn't a situation where you're staring down the barrel of a life sentence. Like Jesus, come yeah, on, man. It was pretty. And again, I don't know all the charges they had on Remo. I mean, Remo by this point was a copper regime in the Colombo crime family. He was a big time uh, mobster, but Again, um, as you said, I don't believe there are any murders involved here. And you know, Remo was a, a Cosa Nostra guy. To, to just flip over some cigarettes is crazy. Um, so, yeah, you know, the cigarette thing was big business. But, you know, now they were killing people. And that's one kind of common theme with Jimmy Burke. Uh, Jimmy Burke truly also, we talked about Tommy Patera last week. Uh, Jimmy was another one in belief that no body, no crime. Um, you know, if you're going to drag... You're going to, yeah, you're going to do something. Uh, you need to go. And Jimmy was a big eliminator. He eliminated people. Uh, if you had to go, you had to go. Um, so Jimmy skates out. He doesn't get in trouble for that charge because there was no evidence again. And the only witness had died uh, on their uh, murder, on, on that murder. So Remo's dead and not going to testify. Uh, in 1971, this is where things start to get interesting for Jimmy Burke. Um, you know, he's obviously, he's become a, a big time, uh, mobster. He's moving around in a lot of different things. And one of the things he grabs is 
there was a gangster in the Gambino crime family called uh, William Billy Bats Benvena. Benvena was a John Gotti loyalist. He was uh, a friend of Gotti's, uh, and he was a big time loan shark. Um, Jimmy, while Benvena is locked up, basically takes over the loan shark business. And what Jimmy does basically is he pumps a ton into it. It's, it becomes just a way better loan sharking organization than what bats was doing. Um, so basically the Gambinos kind of were just like, whatever you're doing better than bats. He's not around anyway. Salud. So in 1971, Billy bats is released from prison. He comes home at Robert's lounge. Like in the movie, they throw him a welcome home party. Um, and remember Roberts was owned by Burke. Uh, Henry Hill is stated as testifying that Hill stated that Benvena saw Tommy D. Simone and basically joked and said about him shining shoes, which we see in the movie. Yep. Uh, Tommy at this point has got a chip on his shoulder, like in the movie. Uh, and anything that was said in jest was taken literally. And Tommy was a sensitive guy. He basically takes as an insult. Um, and D. Simone basically leans over to Burke and Hill and says, I'm going to kill that fuck. Uh, so he leaves. That's that. He didn't come back, you know, the next day or anything. Two weeks later, on June 11th, uh, 1970, Ben Vane is at the suite, a nightclub owned by Henry Hill in Jamaica, Queens. And that night, Tommy basically comes in. He pistol whips Ben Vane, and they basically start beating him and, and kicking him. Uh, and Ben, uh, ben Vane is, is, is taking it, and D. Simone basically yells to him, shine these fucking shoes and just continues to beat him mercilessly. Um, so they end up killing him as the movie portrays. Um, they place his body in the back of a car. Uh, they stop. That was a true story. They did stop at D Simone's mother's to get a shovel uh, and some lie. Um, and they begin to hear sounds from the trunk and they realize Ben Vane is still alive. Um, they basically then go to the back of the trunk and beat him to death with a shovel and tire iron. Uh, they take him up to New York, upstate. Jimmy Burke had a friend that owned a dog kennel, and they bury him there. A couple of months later, uh, Ben Vane has disappeared. Nobody knows where he is. John Gotti starts to get pissed off. This is John Gotti's guy, um, and he starts wondering. Burke finds out from the dog kennel owner that he sells the property to a housing developer, and they basically are ordered to go up and grab the body and put it somewhere else. Um, now, Henry Hill wrote a book and for whether you believe Hill or not, I don't know that I believe him in this facet, but he basically said that they took the body and crushed it in a compactor at a junkyard. Um, but in the movie, um, when, when they were doing commentary on the film, there was somebody that stated that Ben Vane's body was buried in the basement of Robert's lounge. Um, Listen, I don't know what happened, but all I can say is what could have been left of that body after being buried for three months in the open with nothing with fucking lie put on top of it? Like, yeah, what there, could have been left? Yeah, there probably wasn't much. Um, and, you know, by this point, you know, John Gotti kind of plays a coy. He doesn't do much. He kind of suspected that Burke and, and, ben, and uh, D. Simone were behind it, because if you remember, you know, Jimmy Burke had taken over some of. Billy Batts's, you know, things. I mean, he, he was doing them and, and the mob basically said, look, money's the, the, the obviously the, the purveyor here. And we're not going to worry that much about it uh, as we know. And we'll get into a little bit later. It does come back and bite um, the Jimmy Burke crew. Um, in 1972, there was another incident involving uh, Jimmy Burke and Henry Hill. Um, basically they, uh, are down in Florida, down in Tampa. There was a guy called Gaspar Chiaquillo. He was a uh, guy that basically owed money to a union boss, um, Casey Rosado. He was a friend of Jimmy's from Florida. Chiaco owned, owed a big debt to him, and the guy wouldn't pay. So he sent Jimmy down and Henry down to Florida to basically deal with this guy. Uh, and as stated in the movie, I, I don't know if they threw him and tried to throw him in the lines. I think that was just for show. But Gaspar Chiaco's sister did work for the FBI, and she uh, basically turned them in. 
Uh, and Jimmy and Henry basically get 10 years in federal prison. Jimmy goes to Atlanta. Uh, Henry goes to Lewisburg. Uh, at this point, Jimmy goes into Lu- uh, to Atlanta and he meets a guy called Paul Maisie. Um, we'll talk about Maisie. Maisie was a, a, a mobster from Pittsburgh. Um, and this is some of the things down the road that really start to unravel for Jimmy Burke. A lot of them come up because of Paul Maisie. Uh, Henry uh, and Jimmy are both paroled uh, and they go into uh, and back to Queens. Um, in 1970, um, basically in 1976, uh, they get out of jail and they head on home. And at this point, um, there's bigger fish to fry. Jimmy wants to start making more and more money. By this point, Jimmy is uh, making a ton of money. But the problem, Black Chick, is from all intents and purposes, Jimmy's a big time degenerate gambler. He's spending a ton of money. Uh, he's got high life habits. And uh, he needs something or a multitude of different things that are going to be able to scratch that money itch. They're going to make him more money, big time money. Um, and this is where the two schemes come in that really start to make Jimmy a whole lot of money. Uh, in 1980, uh, Jimmy um, is arrested. And you ask why he was arrested. So while he was in prison, he meets this guy, Paul Maisie, a guy from Pittsburgh. He basically tells Jimmy that he has two players at Boston College University that are willing to shave points. Now, just a little bit of a primer for anyone who doesn't know what that means. That basically means that Players on Boston College would know the point spread. They are willing to basically miss shots and do what they can to not cover the spread. And they had a scheme where they would identify what games they would be decent-sized favorites, seven to ten points in, and they would identify those games before the season and basically tell Jimmy and Henry, hey, look, we're going to basically win this game by five or four Right. And they start doling a ton of money out across the country to bookmakers. And this is where they involve Martin Krugman. Now, Martin Krugman was the Maury character uh, in Goodfellas. Uh, Martin Krugman was a, a bookmaker and a, uh, and a scam artist. And he, um, he basically starts acting as a, as a silent runner for these guys. They start putting in tons of bets. Throughout the course of the 1978-1979 season, Blackjack, it was estimated that Jimmy Burke made over a million dollars on this Boston College point spread scheme. An enormous amount of money, especially in, in that time frame, you know, to make on a college basketball point shaving scheme in, it, it, using Boston College, nonetheless. Um, but I mean, as you said, there are certain things that will, uh, that will catch people's attention. And I think, you know, when you gave the Burke quote earlier about, you know, the money, it was always too much money and things like that. This is one of those things. You start messing with fixing sporting events, that'll catch people's attention real quick. Yeah. There's too many people involved. Let's be honest. There's just too many people involved to keep it quiet. And that's what Jimmy realized. And he realized that it wasn't a long-term moneymaker. He made a million bucks. That was that. The problem that Jimmy Burke really had his entire life was he was too greedy. Um, And he was greedy to the point of he would pay, like he made a million dollars through this, this scheme, the Boston college shaving team. Do you know how much he paid the the athletes? Very little would be 2,500 a game. There you go. I mean, and and, you know, when we get into Lufthansa, that was one of his issues there. Um, And this Boston college scheme would kind of come back to, to haunt uh, Jimmy down the road, because again, um, you know, the federal government, um, w- when you're dealing with kids in college and, and you know, scams and the mob, uh, there's a lot going on. And there is a great ESPN 30 for 30 about this yep. um, playing for the mob. It's very good. They interview, uh, you know, all sorts of guys that, that were involved with this. Rick Kuhn was one of the guys involved, one of the players. Um, and, um, you know, they try to get other guys to flip uh, and do things and kind of kind of back them down and, and scare them. And it's a really good documentary if you've never seen it. Um, so they commit this uh, scheme and Jimmy realizes, as I said, that it's not a long-term way to make money. Uh, and Martin Krugman has a connection at the Lufthansa terminal at JFK. Yep. Um, Krugman basically has a, a worker there called Lewis Werner that owed him 20,000 bucks. Uh, 
you know, Werner was, was a degenerate gambler. Krugman was a bookmaker. Uh, and he owed him about 20 grand, which equivalent today is like 90 G's. Uh, so he owed him a lot of money. This guy was pretty much a big loser because any gambler that works in an airport that wastes 90 grand is bad. Um, so as usual, Lewis Werner figures out that there's a flaw in the Lufthansa cargo terminal and that he had information that would quote give them a million dollar or more score so burke creates basically a task force if you will uh, of his most trusted people to do this lufthansa heist it was basically jimmy burke tommy de simone angelo seppe louis cafora joe manry paolo lacastri and robert frenchie mcmahon and if you watch the movie goodfellas uh, there were several folks involved. Now, uh, Burke's son, Frank uh, Burke, would drive a backup vehicle, and then Parnell Stax Edwards would dispose of the vehicle. Now, Stax is in the movie as well. He's played by Samuel L. Jackson. Stax is an interesting guy. Um, Stax Edwards was actually an associate of Tommy D. Simone. They were very close, weirdly enough. Stax was a black guy. He was, um, he was a jazz a musician, blues musician, uh, and he would frequent and hang out at, uh, at at Roberts. Now, obviously, Blackjack, you know this. A lot of us know this. Most very small musicians don't make any money. Nope. Uh, and Stax was a big-time scam artist. He was doing uh, a lot of credit card scams, and um, he would move stolen goods. And you know, he was a good associate. He was a good moneymaker. He wasn't a high-level guy. But according to Paul Vario, he was a master in credit card fraud. Um, so, you know, Stax was a trusted guy. They involve him with this as well. Um, and we'll get into kind of what goes down here. So on December 11, 1978, uh, these guys basically robbed the Lufthansa heist at, uh, Kennedy or a Kennedy airport. Um, and it was pretty simple. It was really kind of similar to the air France robbery. Um, it was estimated that the haul would be about $2 million, but in fact, um, the actual take of the robbery was almost six million dollars, basically five point eight seven five million. Now, again, let, let's continue to talk about this. This is in nineteen seventy eight. Okay, so that's a lot of money now, blackjack. Yep, sure is. When you look at nineteen seventy eight, that's basically the equivalent of I don't know a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a ton. I mean, depending on on what you look at, people say it's about $23 million today, which is, I mean, at the time it was the largest heist in American history, um, you know, up until I think there was a, a, a robbery in, in Los Angeles in the late nineties that topped it. But I mean, to walk out of there with $5.8 million and almost all of it in cash, by the way, is, unbelievable like it is when, when they estimated two when they finally counted this and figured out it was five they had to be stunned yeah i mean basically you hit it on the head i mean five million of it was cash basically almost a million of it was in jewelry um th- this was a huge score and at the time it was the biggest cash robbery now i don't know if this has ever been topped i'd have to look into that um but it was quite the score now this is where, again, Jimmy Burke, due to his greediness, really starts to hurt himself. Um, it was said that Lewis Werner was to receive basically 10% of the take. Um, and again, that would, you know, most of it would go to Martin Krugman, which he owed. And then Krugman would get a score as well for the finder fee. Uh, and each participant, Blackjack, because this is what Jimmy Burke did. He basically said, well, it's only going to be $2 million. And it ended up being six. And Jimmy ends up giving each participant between ten and fifty thousand um, dollars, which is wild. And this is the yeah. issue with Jimmy. He was greedy. I mean, he would yeah. never just kind of take care of people. He was always trying to skim people. People were getting sick of it. People were getting sick and tired of it. So what does Jimmy do? Jimmy basically says, "Fuck them. I'll just start killing them." Yeah, and I think that that goes back to what you talked about before, where he, his philosophy was, you know, no body, no crime. Like, I think that when you're, that's why I say like they must have been shocked when they counted the money because now all of a sudden this is like 
serious fucking money, right? Like this is a ton of money. And you saw it in the movie where, you know, Jimmy Burke is telling everyone, don't go buying shit, right? Like don't go spending money and being flashy. And like, you know, damn well, there's going to be one or two that's going to go do something stupid. You know, they are. And like, if in his head, he's probably thinking, you know what? It's going to be easier and cheaper to just get rid of them. Yeah. And that's kind of what he did. And we'll kind of get into that systematically. Um, one of the people that really fucks up during the Lufthansa heist is Stax Edwards. Stax mm -hmm. basically had to basically hand the getaway van off to the Gambinos and they would destroy it in a compactor. Stax basically, um, you know, instead of driving to New Jersey, goes into Queens and basically in front of a fire hydrant illegally goes into his girlfriend's apartment and, you know, does what he does. And that's that police basically discover the van two days later and they have Stax Edwards fingerprints on them. Uh, Paul Verio finds out Jimmy Burke find out and they basically tell Tommy D Simone, you got to go to kill Stax. Now, again, remember Stax trust uh, Tommy, their friends, um, and they, him and Angelo Seppe basically find Stack at Stax Edwards at his house, uh, who's in hiding at the time. I believe he lived in, I lived in Harlem. Uh, they basically go in, he invites them in, turns his back, they shoot him five times in the head, and he's found in his bed dead. Um, and it was weirdly enough said that Jimmy and Henry and Tommy all contacted Stack's family, talked about how sorry they were about it, uh, and, um, you know, said their goodbyes. Um, but yeah, so Jimmy starts kind of systematically taking care of people. Now, during all this, um, before we get into who he actually killed uh, during this, um, there were some other things going on. If, if um, you remember in the movie, uh, the character Spider, um, <laughs> the Spider was actually a real person. Uh -huh. uh, his, his, yeah, his name was Michael Gianco. Um, he was a server at a card game that they were having. Um, and basically... As the movie portrays, they have an argument um, after Gianco forgets De Simone's drink. Um, De Simone pulls out a gun and shoots him in the thigh. The kid comes back with a big cast on, like in the movie. And remember, he says, you know what, Spider, that bandage is bigger than your fucking head. Um, they start to goad him about the, the leg. And um, basically, Gianco says, you know, fuck yourself, basically. Um, Burke basically is impressed by it and kind of goats Tommy up a little bit and that's where um, Tommy just pulls a gun out and shoots him three times in the chest um, and angrily demands that was that good enough for Burke uh, after he goats him uh, Burke's say, furious. Tommy D. Simone did not have a sense of humor no not at all and Burke basically is furious and tells him that he needs to go bury the body and he's going to only do it him, himself no one can help him um, Henry Hill basically would say years later on the Howard Stern show that Michael Gianco, a.k.a. Spider, was buried next to Robert Lounge along with other, bo others, other bodies. Um, so, you know, Tommy basically was the chief enforcer and killer for uh, Jimmy Burke at this point. Jimmy wasn't necessarily getting his hands dirty, um, but they were taking care. Uh, he was taking care of the dirty work. Yeah. Uh, and Tommy DeSimone was a fucking lunatic. I mean, and, uh, by the way, excellent job by Joe Pesci. Yes. Uh, J Joe Pesci is terrific. Um, obviously we know that, um, he obviously probably his best role. Um, he was very good as Russell Buffalito and the Irishman oh. and some other films as well. But, um, he also has a cameo in Bronx tale. A lot of people don't realize at the end. Um, but yes, a very good, uh, a very good, uh, performance by Pesci. Uh, so at this point, uh, Jimmy kind of sees the writing on the wall uh, and he starts systematically, uh, killing, uh, each of, uh, each of the uh, people involved in the uh, in the heist. I, I guess, Blackjack, it's a smart thing to do. I mean, A, you don't really have to pay them, and B, um, they can't really, you know, do anything that's going to hurt you. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think that the, the probably the primary motivator more than the money, because like you said, he was agreeing to pay them based off of the estimate, not the actual heist. So, I mean the money probably wasn't it. I just think that when you realize there's that much money floating around, like you just can't have people being stupid. And well, I think, I think what really people happened, I think what really happened here, Blackjack is 
the associates started to really get pissed off at Burke and basically say, look, like we're involved here. Why the fuck are we only getting this little amount? And you're clearing like $4 million. Yeah. yeah. And I think people were getting sick of it. They're pressuring him. Um, so he first kills Stax. Stax is murdered. Uh, Louis Cafora known as Fat Louie and his newly wed wife, Joanna, were reported missing by their parents. Uh, they were never seen again. It was alleged, though, that Cafora was a, a rat uh, and that um, Jimmy basically had to, to kill him and, and his wife as well. There was no car or anything, if, if you remember in the movie. That, that didn't happen. Right. Uh, Frenchie McMahon and his close friend Joe Manry, they were both found shot to death in a, a Buick parked on a Brooklyn street in 1979. Uh, Paolo uh, Lacastri, who was in a Gambino family, uh, he was involved and found shot to death uh, in a garbage shoot lot in Brooklyn. Uh, his body was on fire when they found it. Uh, and there were some other murders involved as well. Uh, a cosmetologist and cocaine dealer called Teresa Ferrara. Uh, who frequented Robert's Lounge and was a longtime mistress of not only Tommy D. Simone but Paul Vario. Uh, she was also uh, killed uh, in 1979 when it was discovered that she was a rat. Uh, her dismembered torso was found in the Barnegat Inlet near Toms River, New Jersey, and it was uh, assessed that she contacted the FBI, uh, fearing that she would be killed. Uh, so she was also murdered. You know what's interesting to me about this is that he made no effort to hide these killings. Like they didn't bury these bodies. They didn't chop them up and, you know, toss them in the woods. These were all done in the open to be found. I think that's kind of strange, no? Yeah. Um, you know, that's, I'm not going to say that's not no. I mean, it isn't normal. A lot of the time you'll bury them, but there's plenty of hits where they're just done out in the open. Um, and I think it really depends on the time and when they were happening. You're not going to do that today or over the last 20 years, but you know, back even in the eighties, that was done pretty frequently, but you're right. It, it was done very, maybe, maybe, maybe he was doing it to send a message to the rest of the people involved. Like, yeah, if you fuck up, this is what's going to happen. Yes, exactly. Now, um, one of the final people to be killed was, and I've said before, Maury in Goodfellas is one of the worst characters in mob history, as far as movies are concerned. He's a real annoying character. Mm -hmm. um, but in real life, he was pretty annoying as well. Um, it was said that he became just obsessive and annoying over the money that Jimmy owed him. Basically that you know, Jimmy owed him 500 grand he wanted to, to kind of move on with his life. And Hill, Henry Hill basically said it was a matter of a half a million bucks. No way Jimmy was going to deny himself a half a million because of Martin Krugman. If Jimmy killed Marty, Jimmy would get Marty's half a mil. So Jimmy killed him. And that was that. Jimmy was sick of hearing from him and just said, fuck him. He's, he's gone. And they killed Martin Krugman as well. So Jimmy was systematically eliminating every person involved, separating himself from it. Uh, and it would indeed prove well, because at the end of the day, uh, when Jimmy Burke uh, down the road gets jammed up, um, you'll, you'll kind of figure that out. Um, so by this point, um, you know, Jimmy's a rich man. He's made a ton of money. He's had a huge score. Um, but that's not enough. Jimmy needs more. Um, Jimmy basically starts working with a guy uh, called uh, Richard Eaton. Richard Eaton was a... Uh, a real scam artist, if you know anything about Richard Eaton, but he was also a, a drug dealer as well. Uh, and they basically start uh, selling drugs. The problem was um, Richard Eaton um, in one of the drug situations basically sells some uh, bullshit drugs. They're not real drugs. Uh, Jimmy becomes enraged uh, and, and murders Richard Eaton. So this is really one of the last killings that uh, Jimmy would be involved with. The problem with this murder and the other ones is there was some proof that Jimmy did it. I guess when they found Richard Eaton, um, when they found the strangled body in, in a, in a lot, uh, the body was so frozen. And th this is an ode to the movie. If you remember the one character, the body was so frozen that it took days to thaw it out. And once they thawed the body out, they found a small little address book in the lining of Eaton's clothing with the name, address, and telephone number of one James Burke listed. Um, so that obviously sets a big problem up. By this point, Henry Hill is a drug user. Uh, he's starting to get involved with his own product. He starts moving drugs with Paul Maisie. Um, he gets jammed up, uh, as we know. 
uh, Henry Hill uh, decides that uh, he doesn't want to go to jail for 20 to life. And uh, he starts informing. Um, at this point, he basically tells authorities that DeSimone, um, or not DeSimone, that, that Burke, you know, he starts cooperating. During this time, though, and right before this time, Jimmy basically suspects that Henry is an informant and that he's doing stuff he shouldn't be doing. And if you remember Black Chick in the movie, they meet at that diner. Yep. Um, and Jimmy kind of feels him out a little bit. By this point, uh, De Simone finds out that uh, he's going to be made. Uh, and he's all excited about it. Um, and he goes to the ceremony. Uh, as we know, though, at the ceremony, it doesn't last long. Uh, he's basically kidnapped and taken to the uh, Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, uh, where John Gotti exacts revenge. Their people kill uh, Tommy De Simone uh, in the basement of the Bergen Club. And uh, that was that. He had to go. Um, he killed Billy Bats unsanctioned, and Billy was a made man, by Jim. Yeah, I mean, listen, there are certain rules you just can't cross. And, you know, killing a made man when you're not, it's bad enough if you're one yourself. You still may, you still may be killed for it. But uh, doing it when you're not is a pretty ballsy move. And, you know, like we said, Tommy D. Simone was like 28, 29 years old when he was killed. And, I mean, he did a lot in a short time frame, but by all accounts, Tommy D. Simone was just, I mean, it was a matter of time, Jeff, right? I mean, he was, he was a goddamn lunatic. Yeah. And yeah, he had to go. He was a psychopath. Um, again, by this point, 1980, Henry Hill's arrested for drug trafficking, uh, becomes an FBI informant to avoid a long prison sentence and goes into the witness protection program. Hill had been drawn into that cocaine business. And again, if you remember, the movie is pretty real in the fact that you know, Paul Vario and a lot of other people told them not to go into the drug business, but Hill sets the network up and he's making too much money. Um, keep in mind, uh, Lewis Werner, uh, he also uh, gets jammed up. Uh, and he's actually the only person to this day as far as um, the Lufthansa heist. And I think up until recently, I think Vincent Asaro was involved. And he got arrested, another mob guy. But um, Robert Warner, or sorry, Lewis Warner is... Uh, was one of the only people actually prosecuted for the case, but he becomes an informant after serving just one year in prison in the hopes that he'll get an early release. Um, so Hill starts singing. Hill starts talking about um, Robert's lounge. They get a search warrant. Um, and, you know, he basically tells them about all the bodies uh, partially as a result of the testimony by not only Lewis Werner, but Henry Hill on 19 on April 1st, 1980, Jim Burke is taken into custody on suspicion of a number of crimes. In 82, he's convicted in federal court of fixing Boston College basketball games as a part of that point skate shaving scheme in 1978 and gets 20 years in prison. Um, Burke has said uh, to have said, I gave that little bastard, Henry Hill, some bucks to bet on games. That's all. Authorities knew that he had planned and organized the Lufthansa heist, but they didn't have enough evidence to actually prove it. And to the day that Jimmy Burke died, he was never convicted of the Lufthansa heist. Um, that's one good thing about Jimmy. He was never really connected to much of anything um, outside of the, the basketball scheme uh, and uh, one murder. It was suspected that Jimmy committed more than 50 murders in his lifetime, but he actually was only convicted of one, which is a pretty big theme in uh, mob culture. Uh, the only murder he was actually convicted of was Richard Eaton, the hustler and con man that uh, schemed him out of things. And if you remember, they found his address on them. Um, that was that for Jimmy Burke. Uh, the state case uh, involved the murder, and he would later be charged with that murder based on more evidence that Henry Hill gave. At the trial, Hill took the stand and testified against his former friend, Jimmy Burke. Um, and he also testified that Eaton had convinced Jimmy Burke to invest money in that cocaine deal that Eaton kind of screwed him out of. Um, basically, it's funny, too, because... At one point, Hill asked Burke where Robert Eaton or Richard Eaton was, and Burke responds, I whacked that fucking swindler out. He also told Henry that it would be a lesson to other drug purchasers who had not yet paid Burke. Uh, based on all the evidence, um, Burke was convicted, and on February 19, 1985, he was given a life sentence uh, where he would serve in uh, state prison. Uh, he also protested that that bastard died of hypothermia. Um, I love that. I love that. 
when he was leaving New York on an airplane, he looked down at JFK and said to an officer, once upon a time, that was all mine. So he was a colorful guy too. Um, now there was, um, there was attempts by uh, Ed McDonald, who uh, was the special assistant U.S. attorney. He did attempt to involve Jimmy in some other things, but the only murder that he ended up being convicted of was the Eaton murder. So, you know, it's interesting, Blackjack, because when you look back at Jimmy Burke, the two crimes that he was arrested for were mostly small portions of his life. They weren't huge moneymakers. I mean, the boss college thing was, but you know, the big crimes, the, the heist, he was never actually convicted of. Yeah. It's really kind of interesting that, that they were able to get away with that when you consider not the heist itself, right? Like the heist itself is one thing and it's obviously a huge, huge crime, but the amount of murder that happened after like that they weren't able to tie any of this back to the Lufthansa heist is just incredible. Yeah. Um, but for Jimmy, it didn't last too long. Uh, basically Jimmy survived um, for about 10 years. Uh, he was up at Wendy correctional facility in New York city or New York state. Uh, he developed lung cancer. Uh, and on April 13th, 1996 at age 64, Jimmy Burke dies. Uh, at the Roswell Park Center Cancer Institute in Buffalo, New York. Um, weirdly enough, had he lived, uh, Jimmy Burke would have been eligible for parole in 2004, um, but it didn't matter because he died. A um, couple things about Jimmy Burke's family. Uh, Jimmy's uh, son, Frank, uh, actually was killed in 1987 uh, while he was in prison. Uh, his son turned into quite a uh, little criminal himself. Um, he was a suspect in the Lufthansa heist, if you remember. He became basically a, a well-known heroin addict in mob circles, and they've been arrested many times for possession. Um, he would move around at Robert's Lounge and um, you know, was messing around in mob circles. Uh, he was found shot to death uh, in Cypress Hills, Brooklyn uh, in 1987. And um, according to prison officials, there's no remorse or grief from Burke about the death of his son. I think he realized his son was his son and uh, he was involved in the life. And Jimmy was a stone cold mob guy. At the end of the day, he knew that there were two ways out of the life. You die or you go to jail. That was it. Um, his other son, Jesse James Burke, was not involved at all in organized crime. And uh, from what's known, he's still alive. Uh, his, Kath his daughter, Catherine, um, weirdly enough, Blackjack married Anthony and Delicato, which if that name's familiar to you, uh, we talked about that last week in the Tommy Patera show. Uh, Anthony and Delicato was a uh, murderer in his own right, and he was the protege of um, his father, Alphonse and Delicato, and was the mentor to Tommy Patera. So uh, his daughter was involved with the mob per se. Uh, and as of uh, the late 2000s, they still lived in the house that Burned, Burke owned in Howard Beach, Queens. So a lot of mob connections still for the Burke family. One thing we know about Jimmy Burke, Blackjack, um, he was a mobster through and through. He was never a made man. He could never be a made man. But I think we could agree that if he were an Italian, he probably could have been a boss, right? I mean, I think that he certainly would have, have risen very quickly. I mean, his he seemed to have a very keen sense on, um, we'll call it financial matters. I think he knew how to make money. He certainly wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. But on the other side of that coin, he was also pretty smart about it, right? Because of everything you just said, like you think about all of the things that he did and they actually were only able to tie very little of it to him. So yeah, I think that, I think that had he been an Italian guy, like Jimmy Burke would have risen very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the sky would have been the limit for him. And it's weird because, you know, back then um, they obviously had a lot of rules. Now today um, there are people that are not Italian that have been made John staff in Philadelphia made anybody. So you didn't have to be uh, fully Italian, but back in those days, um, everybody was uh, everybody w had to be Italian. Now a couple of other loose end tie ups here, uh, as we talked about uh, Tommy DeSimone uh, died uh, Paul Vario died as well. Uh, he died in uh, 1988 down at uh, uh, Federal Prison in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, he was imprisoned uh, on racketeering uh, and was doing a time also for uh, extortion. Uh, and again, Henry Hill testified against him as well. Uh, he died of lung failure. 
Uh, so yeah, basically to this day, none of the involved people are alive. Uh, Henry Hill uh, passed away uh, as well. He actually died pretty recently. Uh, Henry Hill has turned into a bit of, uh, he turned into a bit of a, a, you know, scumbag really. I mean, he was always kind of a scumbag, but uh, by the end of his life, uh, he was a drunk. He was a drug addict. Yeah. Um, he had left the witness protection program and he was doing a lot of stuff in, um, in the entertainment world. He wrote a book. He was always on Howard Stern. I remember he'd always come on Howard Stern drunk out of his mind. Uh, he did some 60 minute stuff and uh, he did consult as well on the uh, Goodfellas movie and playing for the mob, the ESPN documentary. Uh, Henry Hill died uh, in 2012 after a long battle with heart disease. Uh, he had been sick for a long time, according to his uh, girlfriend, and his heart gave out. Again, he didn't die in prison, though, and he went out pretty peacefully, according to his longtime uh, partner, Lisa Caserta. So there you go. Uh, everyone is dead involved here. But I think the thing we can take out of the Jimmy Burke story is that um, he is the most successful non-Italian mobster, really outside of probably Meyer Lansky, um, several others. Um, obviously, Meyer would probably be the... Yeah, I mean, Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, guys like that. But, I mean, in terms of, you know, the... the present day. The, yeah, present day New York families, nobody touches Jimmy Burke. No, no. And again, not only was Jimmy Burke a money man, but he was a a cold, calculated, callous individual. And we said before, uh, at the end of the day, Jimmy Burke's downfall was not the fact that he loved money. Well, he did love money, and that was his downfall. But he was just greedy. I think if he would have just took care of people um, and, and wasn't so quick. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the problem was the Richard Eaton hit. It got uh, it got dirty, and he got jammed up in it. He, he never showed evidence, and this was the one piece of evidence that they found. Uh, I'll leave uh, Blackjack this. Um, and I don't know if this has ever been proven, but there was a rumor that when Jimmy was in jail in 1990, he found out about Goodfellas and that Robert De Niro was going to play him in the movie. And that according to prison officials, he was ecstatic about it. And there was a rumor that he actually called De Niro uh, and gave him a couple of pointers. Uh, keep in mind though, years later, screenwriter Nick Pileggi would deny it saying that De Niro and Burke had never spoken, but uh, there were men around the set all the time that had known all the principal characters. So, you know, all in all, I'm sure uh, Jimmy knew about it and Jimmy seemed pretty proud of it. I mean, listen, if you're going to have someone play in a movie, Bobby De Niro is not the worst choice. Yeah, in the world, right? probably I mean, be the, the one you want most, right? Yeah, I mean, Robert De Niro is about as good as it gets. So, um, yeah, I'd imagine he was pleased with that. And listen, I think De Niro played him perfectly. So, So what we'll remember from him is, Jimmy Burke was really everything that he had wanted to be, but he's everything that we thought he would be. Jimmy Burke had no shot to succeed. Um, Jimmy Burke from the age of two was abandoned. Jimmy Burke never had a family really outside of a couple caring people from Queens. Uh, and Jimmy Burke was made into a, a sociopathic uh, gangster basically at the end. Yeah. Of the I mean, I, I forget who it was in, in one of our episodes that we were talking about, Horatio Alger stories. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Burke is a Horatio Alger story, right? Like he is a kid who came up with one of the worst possible childhoods you can imagine and made a life for himself. And granted, I, it's not to say that he made a great life for himself because he certainly killed a lot of people and that's not a good thing. But I think that he made the best out of what he was dealt because that kid with the childhood we discussed, man, there's no, there's no path for that, that kid to be a normal, productive member of society. There just isn't. So I, I think he, uh, you know, to borrow the phrase, I think he kind of made chicken salad out of chicken shit to a certain degree. Yeah, uh, I guess all in all, in, in terms of success, he did make a ton of money, but um, you know, he did it the wrong way. Uh, and again, he had no real shot to ever succeed. Um, so that's that. Jimmy Burke. Uh, our first non-Italian, we're really outside of uh, the Black Mafia, uh, but you know Jimmy Burke was, was one we had to do, the Goodfellas story we had to do. Maybe we'll do uh, a Tommy D. Simone story down the road. Uh, next week, we will do Joe Messino, though. I, you know, I, I, I watched Goodfellas last week, and I thought, you know what, let's just do 
Jimmy Burke, people I think will like the show. Um, maybe they'll learn something they didn't know. Uh, and yes, we'll do Joe Messino next week. Um, probably going to do Al Capone here soon. Uh, we'll yeah. do Lucky Luciano here soon. Um, I, I do want to do Kabani Savage. He's a drug dealer I want to get to. Um, all sorts of guys to still do. Uh, all people to still do. Uh, if you ever have someone you want us to take a look at, make sure you reach out. I do want to do uh, Merit Bagula. He was a Russian mobster. Um, you know, all sorts of guys. So yeah, I love the Vegas guys. You know, like we talked yep. about Meyer Lansky. Yep, we got to do Meyer. We got to yeah. do. Um, Benny Binion is a, is another fascinating sure. guy. Like, there's a lot of guys that are. You know, Tony Spilatro, guy from Chicago. Yeah. To do him as it were, instrumental in the building of Las Vegas. Sure, hundred percent. Uh, so yeah, uh, Carmine Persco, we need to do the snake. Uh, we got a lot of uh, ones to do. Uh, so if you ever have someone you want us to talk about, uh, just reach out. Um, we'll, we'll get to them. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for checking out the show. Uh, I know we have a little bit of a cult following. We thank you for checking it out. And uh, if you enjoy it, make sure you subscribe and, and leave us a comment. Let us know what you think of it. Um, Blackjack as always great show. Love doing these. These are always so fun, you know? Uh, so yeah, we'll be, we'll be back ne next week with another show. Sounds good. Joe Messino next week, but this has been Jimmy Burke. Uh, we'll see you next week here on The Sit Down. Have a great night. I'm Jeff Native. He's Blackjack Fletcher. We'll see you later.